On behalf of Equestrian Canada, we welcome everyone to our webinar offered this evening to our paradressage community. We hope you will find this session both informative and entertaining. For those not familiar with the Zoom features, we ask that you mute your line to avoid any background interference during the presentation. If you wish to submit a question during the presentation, please do so using the Q&A function, which you should find at the bottom of your screen. As we have a lot of people joining us tonight, we do ask for your patience if we experience technical difficulties during the presentation. Without further delay, I introduce you to Clive Milkins, our technical advisor for the Paradressage Equestrian Program, for our introduction to our presenter. Hi, good evening everyone, and welcome to tonight's Equestrian Canada's webinar on classification. This comprehensive guide will help explain the purpose of classification, the reasoning behind it, and what it actually means to you, the developing athletes, parents, coach, or somebody who's interested in para in general. Tonight's presentation is brought to you by my friend and colleague, Sue Fole, whom, I'm, whom I've been working with closely for several years. Sue, with the help of EC Para Dressage Coordinator, Jamie Ann, has re revolutionized the classification system in Canada over the past few years enabling more athletes to be classified and persuading more and more physios to become classifiers, therefore broadening our reach throughout the country. Sue has over 45 years of experience in the Canadian equestrian world. She has been a dressage steward at national events for over 11 years, apart from her physio knowledge. Sue is a licensed physiotherapist in the province of Ontario and has been practicing for over 40 years in a variety of settings, including public and private health practices. Sue is both a national classifier and an FEI international level one classifier, often representing Canada at international events. Sue is also the chair of the, Nas the Canadian National Paradressage Classification Advisory Group and also sits on the National Paradressage Committee. Sue also sits alongside myself as a research consultant on the current International FEI Classification Research Group. I'm sure we are all, all going to learn a lot tonight as Sue untangles the mysterious world of classification. If anybody has any questions, they can be typed and we can answer them at the end of the evening. Thank you very much, Sue. Over to you. Thank you very much for that introduction, Clive. And thank you to all for joining me this evening as we present the classification information webinar. It is my goal to demystify the world of EC classification. Next slide, please. In order to understand the purpose of classification, it is first important to have an understanding about paradressage competition. Next slide. What is paradressage? Well, it's an equestrian sport that was developed in the 1970s, actually from the therapeutic riding centers. And it was developed in Europe in order to allow people with disabilities the opportunity to compete on a level playing field. Athletes are judged on their riding skills and their effectiveness on, on their horse and not on their impairment. Paradressage competition came under the umbrella of the FEI in 2006. Of note, para does not stand for paraplegic. It comes from the word parallel as the athletes with disabilities are riding in a dressage competition structure that parallels able-bodied dressage competition. Next slide, please. So what is paradressage? Well, it is definitely an opportunity to enjoy the freedom and movement of your horse. 
It's an opportunity to ride and train your horse to execute patterns of movements similar to able-bodied dressage. It's an opportunity to compete alongside your peers and being judged on your riding skill and not your impairment. You have opportunity to progress to higher level competitions or simply enjoy the sport recreationally. You can challenge yourself to learn a new skill and continue to fine tune your expertise. And you definitely get to experience a wonderful partnership with your horse. Next slide. Paradressage in Canada falls under the responsibility of the Paradressage Committee. So the Equestrian Canada Paradressage Committee is responsible for developing programs for paradressage community from the grassroots to the international level. This committee has representation from all stakeholders in competition, from coaches, trainers, um, to uh, judges and classifiers. There are now many opportunities for the paradressage athlete to compete, including um, starting with the video competitions in the comfort of your own arena or at local dressage shows that have integrated paradressage classes into the competition. at their grade level. And the grade level challenges them to ride at the maximum level of their functional abilities. Next slide, please. The classification advisory group is an ad hoc group established to develop classification standards and policies at the direction of the EC Senior Manager of Dressage, Olympic and Paralympic programs and is under the accountability of the Director of Sport. They are responsible to review and approve eligible athlete classification requests. Next slide, please. So what is the purpose of classification? The International Paralympic Committee, or the IPC, defines it as the grouping of athletes into sport classes according to how much their impairment affects fundamental activities in each specific sport of discipline. I don't know about you, but this did not clarify things for me the first time I read it. So let's take a deeper look into classification. Next slide, please. Classification is a means of evaluating an athlete's functional ability, that is to say what they're able to do, resulting from their impairment and the remaining areas of their bodies that can function. Equestrian Canada classifies our athletes in accordance with the methods and standards of the FEI. Next slide, please. Classification is a means of evaluating an athlete's functional ability resulting from their impairment. As a result of the classification session, a profile is allocated to the athlete after the evaluation is completed. There are 48 different profiles. Profiles are based on the area of the impairment and the degree of the impairment. There are five sport grades of competition, and each grade has allocated profiles in order to allow a 
fair competition between the athletes within each grade. So classification will determine which profile and which sport grade the athlete is placed in. The result, this results in athletes with differing functional impairments being able to compete on a level field of play. So for example, an athlete with a single-sided arm impairment can compete against an athlete with a single-sided lower leg impairment. So they're in, where their area of impairment is very different, but the impact of the impairment is very similar. And that's how these riders are grouped. Next slide, please. So classification introduces the fairness, as we've said. It provides riders with a physical disability the opportunity to compete against other riders with similar challenges. The rules for classification are based on international guidelines for para sport and then made sport specific. That is to say, the rules for EC classification are compliant with the international guidelines for para sport as determined by the International Paralympic Committee and then they are made sport specific through the FEI, para dressage. Riders are assessed by accredited classifiers and assigned their profile and their grade. We look at areas such as muscle power, joint range, and coordination. Next slide, please. Classification is not an evaluation of your riding skill and your riding level. This is a conversation between your coach and your trainer, not the classifiers. Classification is not saying it is safe for you to ride. This is a conversation between you and your doctor. But note that if the classifier becomes aware that you have a health condition and the classifier believes that the impact of this condition may make it unsafe for the athlete to complete, compete, the classification session may be stopped and the athlete is not eligible to be classified. And find oops, it is not to say that you are ready to challenge the FEI para tests at your grade. We all have a learning curve and some of us will never achieve the FEI level. For we must remember the FEI tests are the highest skill of, an, of a rider and not all of us are going to achieve that. And classification is not an inclusive system. Indeed, it is set up to exclude athletes who do not meet the criteria of the classification system. Next slide, please. So who can classify? At the EC level, the classification personnel is a physiotherapist or a doctor of medicine who has been accredited by EC to classify athletes with physical impairments, that is orthopedic neurological uh, conditions. However, visual impairments are classified by an ophthalmologist or an optician who is also accredited as a vision classifier through Blind Sports Canada. Next slide, please. And here's the team. Our national classifiers are um, authorized through EC to conduct the evaluations for athletes who are ready to compete in Canada at the silver and gold level of competition. At this time, bronze level athletes are not required to be classified. They will complete a separate form in order to compete at the bronze level. As stated previously, a classifier is a licensed physiotherapist or medical doctor who has the qualification and the abilities relevant to conduct all or 
specific parts of the athlete evaluation. They must have experience in working with people with various impairments and must have a clear understanding of the paradressage classification system. We currently have five national classifiers active in Canada, one of which is an approved FEI classifier. And in our photo, we have four of our national classifiers. Uh, missing is our classifier, uh, Kim from BC. Next slide, please. Eligibility. The athlete must have an identified health condition that leads to an eligible impairment, which is permanent, verifiable, and measurable through the classification system. Throughout the presentation, you're gonna hear me come back to this statement. These are the athletes that we can classify. So athletes with a learning disability must have a physical disability in order to uh, compete. Next slide, please. So what is an eligible impairment? So here's the list of the nine eligible impairments for paradressage. We have impaired muscle power, impaired passive range of movement. That means how well the joint moves. We have loss of limb or a limb deficiency. We have a leg length difference, short stature, hypertonia, ataxia, athetosis, and visual impairment. At the bottom, we have noted intellectual impairments. They're not included in para-equestrian sport unless there is a physical or visual impairment. So let's take a look at some examples of eligible impairments. Um, before we do that, what I want to say is, um, I know this sounds very confusing with words such as impairments and health condition when we are used to hearing words like diagnosis and disability. The reason is there are far too many diagnoses and they're being added to daily and that we have different diagnoses called one thing in Canada and something totally different in Australia. It is far too confusing to develop a system based on the word diagnosis. So the IPC, International Paralympic Committee, standards now look at the eligible impairments or how the athlete is able to function. But there also must be an underlying health condition. In Canada, this is what we call a diagnosis, and that which uh, substantiates the reason for the impaired function. To understand classification, we need to talk in terms of impairment and health condition. It's like learning a whole new language. Next slide, please. So on this slide, we can see in the left column, the impairments. In the right-hand column, you're gonna see a description of the impairment. So for the example, the first one talks about um, impaired muscle power, so reduced muscle force generated by muscles or muscle groups. And for example, they're saying from a spinal cord injury, spina bifida, or polio. If we look at impaired passive range of motion, it would be um, range of movement in one or more joints that is reduced permanently. And it's due to um, some sometimes hereditary or some disease that has taken place in that. So a good example would be arthrogryposis, where the person is born with deformed joints. We look at limb deficiency. I think that one is fairly straightforward, but it can be as a result of a trauma or it can be congenital, where there is an absence of a limb. Very often we see hands and feet that uh, did not develop a leg length difference, which is bone shortening in one leg due to a congenital deficiency or again from trauma. 
And note, it needs to be a significant leg difference. So if you're a quarter inch out, that doesn't cut it. It needs to be significant. Those people of short stature. So reduced standing height due to abnormal dimensions of bones of upper limb and lower limbs of trunk or trunk. And uh, for example, it could be a growth hormone dysfunction. Hypertonia, which is increased muscle tension and the reduced ability of a muscle to stretch due to a neurological condition, such as cerebral palsy, brain injury, or multiple sclerosis. Ataxia, so that's the lack of coordination of muscle movement. And again, due to a neurological condition, such as cerebral palsy, brain injury, or multiple sclerosis. Athetosis is generally characterized by an unbalanced and involuntary movements and difficulty maintaining a symmetrical or an equal posture side to side. And again, this is due to a neurological condition, often cerebral palsy, brain injury, or multiple sclerosis. And finally, visual impairment. So the description of this is that the vision is impacted by either an impairment of the eye structure, the optical nerves, optical pathways, or the visual cortex, which lays within the brain. So it's very clear the description of what the eligible impairment is and what it looks like. Next slide, please. So indeed, there are not eligible diagnoses. So when the following conditions exist with no other physical or visual impairment, the athlete is not eligible for classification. So this includes wear and tear on joints due to advancing age, general debilitating diseases, obesity, skin diseases, sleep-related re movement disorders, epilepsy, fatigue syndromes such as uh, chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia, internal organ dysfunctions, heart or circulatory conditions, pain, including chronic pain syndromes, osteochondritis, impairments of mental function, including intellectual impairment, conversion disorder, dementia, learning impairments, sleep-related movement disorders. Excessive movement of joints are not eligible for a classification. Breathing problems, vertigo and dizziness, and um, visually impaired athletes that do not have significant uh, visual impairments. Hearing impairment is not eligible. And finally, reflex sympathetic dystrophy, which is a complex uh, pain syndrome is not eligible unless there is permanent joint um, passive range of motion impairment. Sometimes you'll see these health conditions are too variable. Um, people with chronic uh, fatigue syndromes, sometimes they're able to do something and then two days later they can't and then maybe a month later they can do more and then the next day they can't. So that is too variable to be able to classify and place that athlete into our riding system. Occasionally an athlete may have both an eligible and an ineligible impairment. In these cases, the impact of the ineligible impairment cannot be taken into account when assigning a profile. Next slide, please. So again, not eligible, eligible conditions include those athletes with intellectual impairment unless there is an underlying physical or visual impairment. Next slide, please. Now that an eligible impairment has been determined, for example, impaired muscle power, the athlete must now provide information on the underlying medical condition. So in Canada, we call this a diagnosis. 
they must complete the certificate of diagnosis. So continuing with the example of impaired muscle power, an underlying medical condition of spinal cord injury would be eligible for that person indeed would have weakness in their muscles. However, an underlying medical condition of weakness due to arthritis or pain would not be eligible. In some cases, the certificate of diagnosis completed by the athlete's general practitioner is sufficient documentation for their impairment. As we described earlier, all impairments must be verifiable, permanent, and measurable in order to qualify for classification. Next slide, please. Sometimes athletes might have a bit of a fluctuation in their condition, or they might be a little bit of a change in their, um, con their um, health condition. So for example, multiple sclerosis is the condition that may fluctuate a little bit. It may have a general decline over time. So in order to help understand how the impairment uh, impacts this athlete, we may request further medical documentation. So we might need a signed report or letter written by the relevant medical specialist, for example, in, for MS and neurologist. We may ask for test results, such as MRI scans, evoked potentials, muscle biopsies, um, in order to determine the diagnosis. And this is for a reason. If we look at neurological conditions, some of them can be temporary. Some can be very temporary. For example, if I really bumped my elbow hard, I could create a nerve injury and have pins and needles and weakness into my baby finger. However, a few minutes later, these symptoms will resolve and my nerve has fully recovered. That type of injury is not eligible for paradressage or classification. However, a nerve injury with a positive test result that demonstrates a significant and permanent injury is eligible. So you will see some of the times the classifiers will respond to your request by asking for additional supporting documentation to help them understand about your uh, situation to see if you're eligible to be classified. Next slide, please. So the athlete has fulfilled and sent in all their information and the classification advisory group has reviewed the documentation and has determined that there is an eligible impairment with an underlying health condition. All the paperwork has been accepted. What is the next step? The next step is the athlete evaluation. The athlete will meet with the classifiers to undergo an evaluation. Standard medical tests are performed from head to toe on each and every athlete. That is to say, just because your injury is on your left foot, it does not mean we don't assess your arms and your spine and the other leg. So the tests follow the FEI standards. The areas tested are joint movement, also known as range of motion, strength, which is referred to as muscle power, and coordination tests. So we test the coordination of the athlete to perform certain movements. Next slide, please. The athlete and their coaches are responsible for reading the paradressage handbook and the classification package prior to the evaluation session. We need informed participants at the time of the evaluation session. Athletes are strongly encouraged to bring their coaches to this session. Coaches are um, encouraged to be there. However, during the testing, they are asked to remain quiet 
unless the classifier has a specific question for them. When testing is completed, there will be an opportunity for the coaches to discuss adaptive equipment and answer other questions that they have. Athletes may wear their riding clothing and should bring their adaptive equipment or compensating aids with them. However, particularly for those athletes that are coming from a distance, just bring pictures of your saddle. If we can't figure it out, we'll send you back to take more pictures. Athletes are expected to put their best effort into testing. Not doing so may cause the session to be suspended. As no profile or grade can be assigned, assigned when this occurs, the athlete will not be able to compete in paradressage. We love your questions. We will do our best to answer them at the time of the athlete evaluation. Next slide, please. Not every athlete who has an eligible impairment will be eligible for paradressage. The standard of impairment set by the FEI states there must be a 15% loss of function in an area, for example, the whole arm or the whole leg. The minimum impairment criteria may be determined through the review of the data or documentation, or it may um, be uh, apparent as a result of the athlete evaluation session by the classifiers in compliance with the classification rules. So that is to say that you need to have a significant impairment in order to be eligible for classification and paradressage. So although I might have the misfortune of amputating a finger, which I will definitely miss, it will not impact my function sufficient enough to make me eligible for paradressage. Next slide, please. So what happens after the athlete evaluation? The results from the athlete evaluation are reviewed by the classification advisory group. They will assign a profile that best represents the athlete's functional abilities as well as their impairment using the FEI classification rules. As a result of the specific profile, adaptive equipment for the athlete is approved. So again, the profile tells us what the athlete is able to do. Next slide, please. So here's some examples of profiles, and these are taken from the classification rules. The profiles are represented by stick men, as well as a very lengthy description. But I thought you'd like to see what we are looking at when we assign profiles. So here at the top of the page on the left, we see an athlete that is a profile two. You will note that there's dotted lines in the arms, the legs, and the trunk. This represents that this athlete has impairments in both arms, both legs, and the trunk. And the little wheelchair says that they might also be a wheelchair layer user. So the dotted lines represent where the impairment is. If we look to the right-hand side, we see profile 23. And we see with this athlete, the only dotted line is on the lower leg. So this athlete after the trunk of that athlete, this athlete, if you look closely, does not have anything impairment in the arms of the legs. But if you look at the face, you will see X's across the eyes. This athlete is visually impaired and is in profile 36, defined as totally blind. Next slide, please. 
So para dressage classification grades. Sport classes or grades allow for athletes with similar degree of functional impairments to compete against each other. For example, the athlete with one arm reduced in function will compete against an athlete who has one lower leg reduced in function. There are five grades in paradressage. Grade one is for athletes with the greatest degree of impairment. Grade five are for athletes with the least impairment but they still have 15% impairment in one limb. So let's take a look at the grades in more depth. Next slide. So here we have a photo of a grade one athlete. Grade, athletes in grade one have severe impairments affecting all the limbs and the trunk or the spine. The athlete usually requires the use of a wheelchair they may be able to walk with a very unsteady gait and usually not very far. The trunk and the balance are severely impaired. So here we have a picture of Jody Schloss on Lieutenant Lobin, who is uh, representing Canada as a grade one athlete. Next slide. Grade two. So athletes in grade two have either a severe impairment of the trunk and minimal impairment of the upper limbs or moderate impairment of the trunk, upper limbs and lower limbs. So here we're seeing how they're beginning to take athletes that have quite a difference in where the impairment is, but the degree of the impairment remains the same. Most of the athletes in this grade use a wheelchair in daily life. And here we have a picture of Jason Cernowski on Phoenix, who represents Canada in grade two. Next slide, please. Grade three. Athletes in grade three have severe impairments in both lower limbs with minimal or no impact of the trunk or moderate impa impairment of the upper and lower limbs and the trunk. Some athletes in this grade may use a wheelchair in daily life. In this photograph, we see Lauren Barwick on Sandriano, who represents Canada as a grade three athlete. Next slide, please. Grade four athletes have a severe impairment or deficiency of both upper limbs or a moderate impairment of all four limbs or short stature. Athletes in grade four are able to walk and generally do not require a wheelchair in daily life. Grade four also includes athletes with visual impairments, equivalent to B1, following the blind sport classification system. And in this picture, we have a picture of Laura Hall, who is representing Canada in grade four. Next slide, please. And grade five, athletes in grade five have mild impairment of movement or muscle strength or a deficiency of one limb or mild deficiency of two limbs. Grade five also includes athletes with visual impairments equivalent to B2. B2 athletes have some visual acuity as compared to the B1 athletes. In this photo, we have a picture of Lee Gerard and Question in Tryon, representing Canada as a grade five athlete. So how do the profiles get placed into the grades? Next slide, please. So on this picture or, or slide, you can see how the profiles have been placed within each of the grades. So if we look at grade one, we can see that profile one, two, three, five, seven, 12A and 13 compete against each other. If you read within the description of the classification rules, you will see that all of these athletes have severe impairments throughout their entire body. Some might have more in the 
upper extremities. Some might have more in the lower extremities. So again, grade ones have the greatest activity limitation and grade five has the least impairment, um, what's the least in limitation? Next slide, please. And finally, as a result of the athlete evaluation, the athlete will res receive a grade status. In the case of someone that's just starting into the system and has yet to be classified, we refer to them as new. So they must complete their evaluation prior to the national silver and gold competition. An athlete with an observation assessment says that the classifiers wish to observe a video or them riding in competition in order to be able to confirm their profile. And, and time, their spinal cord has improved. Those athletes would be reviewed to see if their profile still fits or they've changed, in which case a more current and appropriate profile will be assigned. And some of the times that means their grade might also have changed. So that grade three um, athlete might have improved and with a new profile might actually now be a grade four athlete. A confirmed status means that the classification advisory group is satisfied that this athlete's profile and grade are correct and their health condition is not going to change. They are confirmed and we do not need to see this athlete for a reclassification or review. And finally, a grade status not eligible. This is the athlete that did not meet the minimal disability criteria and such they're not um, eligible for paradressage. Next slide, please. Paradressage compensating aids. Next slide, please. Each profile may allow athletes to receive approval to use specific compensating aids during competition. These would be listed on the athlete's classification profile. So the purpose of a compensating aid, which is also known as adaptive or specialized equipment, is to level the competitive playing field. So for example, if we have an athlete who has a um, absent leg, they will be allowed to use a whip as a compensating aid on the side of the absent leg in order to give them some way to signal the horse to move. So this is how we level the playing field. So example of simple compensating aids include rubber band to stirrups, looped reins, hard handhold. So while compensating aids are varied and can be unique to an athlete, they should never provide an advantage to the athlete. So again, the athlete with an absent lower leg may be assigned the use of one whip to make up for the deficiency of the one leg. We would not allow them two whips because their other leg works just fine. And that would be unfair to all the other athletes to allow this one to have two whips. So classifiers need to keep this in mind as they're looking to approve requested adaptive equipment or compensating aids. Next slide, please. So here's an example of an adapted saddle. As you can see, 
there is a prominent uh, thigh block at the back. There is a seat saver on the top. Can't quite see, but there is a hard handhold for this athlete. But there's holes on the saddle flap. And in the holes, you can see some white straps. These are pieces of Velcro, and the purpose of which is to help steady the athlete's leg. So that's an example of a um, compensating aid that may be, assigned, may be approved for the athlete to use in competition. Next slide, please. Compensating aids are used by the athlete to compensate for the physical or sensory limitation resulting from their impairment. And this enables them to ride a horse. It is never to be used to compensate for a lack of riding skill or as an aid to enhance the horse's performance. And always the welfare of the horse and the safety of the athlete are paramount in considering the use of any compensating aids. Compensating aids for the athlete must always allow the athlete to fall freely should there be an unplanned uh, departure of the athlete from the horse. Or put in other words, the athlete must be able to fall freely to the ground Compensating aids are not to tie the rider into the tack. Next slide, please. So there are th three categories of compensating aids. Standard compensating aids, which any paradressage athlete can use. So for example, um, the use of saluting with their head only. All para-athletes can use them. It does not need to appear on their paperwork anywhere. These standard aids are from our rule book and all athletes need to know the rules and where to find them. The second category are profile specific compensating aids. These must appear on the athlete's master list in order for them to use them in competition. These compensating aids were determined as a result of classification. So again, um, we may see with the athlete that has severe weakness of both lower legs that they, and they're not able to use their legs effectively on a horse, they might be allowed two whips in order to make up for the lack of leg power. The third type of compensating aid are the non-standard, <coughs> excuse me. These are athlete specific aids and they must be on the athlete's master list again in order for them to be able to use in competition or they will not be able to to use them if they're not on the master list. So, and these aids are not standard profile specific aids. So for example, an athlete who is unable to hold a whip due to a very, very poor hand function may have a wrist strap to help hold the, the uh, whip. And this will be approved by the classification advisory group prior to the use in competition. Another example is some athletes with neurological conditions are much weaker in the hot, humid weather. These athletes may be um, approved to use a cooling vest to help regulate their body temperature. Again, these are not standard. The athlete must specifically request these and they must be approved by the classification advisory group in order to be used in competition. Next slide, please. So on this slide, we see the list of standard compensating aids that all paradressage athletes can use in shows from bronze to platinum. This list describes or shows what they can use, but they don't have to use them if they don't want to. 
So like able-bodied dressage, there are standard pieces of equipment that all riders can choose to use or not use. Not all able-bodied riders have a hand, soft hand holder, the bucking strap on front of their saddle. Some of the um, athletes might prefer to salute with head only. This is particularly good for those athletes that have difficulty letting go and picking up their reins. So rather than putting them at risk, we just let them nod their head and that's how they salute the judge. The trot can be sitting or rising. They may choose not to wear gloves. Some people, their sensation in their hands is such that they cannot feel the reins and so the use of gloves makes it more difficult. Spurs are optional. Saddle, they have to have a saddle, but it can be any type. It could be a Western saddle or a side saddle. They may all have a soft handhold. They can have a deeper saddle, but there are rules about how deep the saddle can be. Magnetic stirrups are allowed in uh, paradressage. As we said before, elastic bands on stirrups, enclosed stirrups, one whip, a breastplate and or a neck strap, a split rein on double bridle, elastic inserts within the reins, safety vests, half chaps, and for grade one, two, and three only, they may use their voice. All of these compensating aids can be used and they do not need to be on the athlete's master list. Next slide, please. For further information about compensating aids and to see the pictures, I suggest you take a look at the FEI Paradressage Compensating Aids photo list. You can follow the um, description here how to get there. Next slide. So, at competition, how do we know what an athlete is allowed to use? These are recorded on the classification master list. So the master list includes the athlete name, profile, grade, allowed compensating aids that are standard for profile or non-standard compensating aids. It does say their classification status and review date if required. EC will be responsible for maintaining the list to include up-to-date and the strictly relevant details. No confidential medical information appears on this list. So how do we find this classification list? Next slide, please. So to find your, the classification master list, you're going to go to Equestrian Canada website click on the bars found in the upper margin and choose sports. Scroll down to paradressage and choose programs. Scroll down till you find classification master list and choose EC paradressage classification master list. All athletes are encouraged to be very familiar with this process because you are expected to access this list for competition purposes. Next slide, please. So here we are looking at what you should see. So as I said before, your name is there. You'll see your profile, your grade, your status, whether you're confirmed or reviewed. And then in the column that says compensating aids, you're going to see the in competition. If you have um, pack check afterwards, then the um, steward will have to eliminate you for having equipment that's not allowed. You'll also see on the bottom right hand side a picture. This is to help the stewards understand what 
the piece of equipment is supposed to look like. So if the classification advisory group approves something, sometimes words don't always capture it. And as we know, a picture is worth a thousand words. So we've included it to help the uh, stewards. So paradressage writers must print a current copy of their EC master list and submit this with their show entry forms. It's part of the requirement of your show entry. You are also advised to keep a copy handy while on competition grounds, as the steward or judges may request to see your master list. If they did not get a copy from the show secretary, it is very acceptable to have your copy stored on your cell phone. It does not need to be a printed version. Next slide, please. Paradressage dispensation certificate. At the bronze level of competition, the athlete does not need to be classified and they can compete by applying and completing the paradressage medical dispensation form. The exception to this is athletes with hearing impairments may use this form for bronze, silver, and gold levels of competition for their hearing loss only. Paradressage dispensation certificate will be issued annually and it will include the athlete's name and the approved compensating aids and the expiry date. Please stay on top of this. Stewards know to look for expiry dates and will question your eligibility to compete if it's expired. Next slide, please. So classification timelines. When should you consider applying for classification? So the short answer is when your condition is no longer changing. We expect that you are fit and that you have returned to riding and you're preparing for competition. This often takes quite some time to get to this level. So the about, on this slide, we see the timelines used by EC. So classification will be conducted one year following a neurological injury. So that would be to your brain, to a nerve um, in your arm or your leg, or a spinal injury, uh, for example, a paraplegic. Classification will be conducted at a minimum of three months following an orthopedic injury which did not require surgery. So that could be an ankle or a wrist or a forearm, but did not require surgery. If surgery was required, you need to wait at least three months or nine months before you can be classified. Next slide, please. So on this slide, we see your guide to athlete classification. So when you want to be classified, you need to contact Equestrian Canada Paradressage Department. You need to request the classification information package. You need to read it, ask questions if you don't understand it, and complete all the documents requested in order to continue on with your uh, progress towards classification. Appendix one is your form for a physical impairment. Appendix two is for a visual impairment. Appendix three is our payment form. You do need to pay for this. Appendix four is a consent for classification. Appendix five is the certificate of diagnosis, which you will get your doctor or um, specialist to complete. And appendix six is a commander uh, compensating aid request, and that is uh, completed by a psychologist if required. Note that the cost of classification is $150 and you must submit all your documentation and your payment at least three months prior to competing. This allows all the stages that you just heard to be completed prior to your competition. Next slide, please. So again, this is the process put in a slightly different way. You need to submit your documentation, 
the classification advisory group determines if you're eligible for competition and if you meet the minimal impairment criteria. If you do this, then we move to the middle column, which is the athlete evaluation, where you'll be assessed on your strength, coordination, range of motion. If the an evaluation session is suspended by the classification panel, we may designate the athlete as classification not completed in accordance with Article 10 of the classification rules. This includes those athletes who we feel are not safe to compete, that they are a harm to themselves or other athletes. And finally, following the exam, the calculations are done, a functional profile is developed, and a grade is assigned, as well as compensating aids are improved. And again, the results are you are eligible for paradressage or you're not eligible for paradressage. Next slide, please. For further information, you can contact Jenny Ann Goodfellow at the paradressage program coordinator at Equestrian Canada at the following email or by phone. You can also get this information on the website. Next slide, please. Thank you for attending this webinar. I hope I have answered many of your questions regarding Equestrian Canada classification for paradressage. And at this time, I'm opening the floor for questions. Okay, thank you ever so much for that, Sue. I'm sure, as you say, that's unraveled a lot of the mysteries behind um, classification. Before we go on to questions, I'd just like to say that as far as the compensating aids and also learning how to use adapted equipment is concerned, um, EC is planning an up and coming webinar pretty soon on both the rules for compensating aids and also for um, how to use and develop adapted equipment. So please keep an eye out for social media and on the EC website for the dates for that up and coming uh, webinar. So we have a, a, a lot of questions to go through and I'll go through them in no particular order. Um, Anne Welsh asks, saddles that aren't on the standard list, would saddles um, such in non-para, such as Australian, Baroque, and section E, um, would they be allowed in para competitions? Yes, they would be, as we are allowing any saddle. However, the saddles must meet the requirements as far as the depth of the saddle, that the athlete is able to fall freely off the horse, and that we do not feel that it is. Um, the horse's welfare is, is um, being taken into consideration. So if we think it might harm the horse, then we would question the use of the saddle. So yes, we do take a variety of saddles. Thank you. Um, one I can answer is yes, the presentation will be added later online as soon as we um, got that up and running. Who completes the dispensation certificate, Sue? And is it stored on the EC website or only held by the competitor? So the dispensation certificate will be completed by the athlete and submitted back to Equestrian Canada for approval. This form is reviewed by the classification advisory group. And when a determination has been made, the information will be on the EC website um, on the same page where the master list is. I do believe that the athlete will also have a copy of their, a hard copy of their dispensation certificate. Thank you. Um, this year, what are the opportunities for um, both national and, in, and international classification with COVID-19 uh, and obviously uh, and Canada? Uh, 
So COVID-19 has ground to a halt all classification opportunities within Canada and the FEI to date. We are working um, along with our uh, federations to develop a return to play um, plan for classifications. But as of today, there are no scheduled national or international opportunities for classification. We will keep you posted though, when it opens up and we're able to resume this. Thank you. Um, what, what does an athlete do or what does a coach do if they don't agree with the final result of the classification? So the athlete can, there is within the rules and with the classification um, package, there is a process for them to um, protest the findings there's also, before we do that, we just like to have a discussion. Very often what happens is because the profile is assigned and the grade is one that the coach feel is well above that athlete's skill level, they feel that we did it wrong. But indeed, we classify the physical functional abilities of the athlete. We do not classify and assign the profile and grade based on their riding skill. So the disparity usually is that the coach knows that the athlete cannot ride at that level. And a lot of that usually is based on they're looking at the FEI tests. In Canada, we have opportunities for these athletes to ride in national shows at whatever test they would like to do, just like in able body. So there is a test that's walk only, a test that's walk trot, and a test that's walk trot and canter. Actually, there's three tests in each of those um, um, areas. So athletes and their coach and their trainer should be looking at the Equestrian Canada tests and getting their athlete to ride in the test that they are capable of doing, not looking at the FEI, which equivalent to able-bodied Grand Prix tests, not over-facing their athlete by trying to get them to challenge those tests. I hope that answered that question. Thank you, Sue, uh, comprehensively. A um, question here from Noni Hartwickson about cooling vests. Are they not allowed in both open and para competitions with no special requests, i.e. without them being on the card? Uh, def well, the, that's a bit of a varied answer in that it depends. If you are, if the steward can visibly see that uh, cooling vest and it does not look like the standards of a rider's vest, then it needs to appear on the athlete's card. If it is something that is underneath their jacket and no one's seeing it, then the, uh, the steward may not look. It is always safer to get these items put on your master list. So at the moment of tack check after the competition, there is no concerns about whether you have legal or illegal equipment on. I'm also answering questions online when I can do to save you doing them as well, Sue, at the moment. Um, Rosemary Greer asked two questions. One, I'm lo located in the UK, can I use my existing card in competitions in the UK? And the second question is, I have an older card dated 2010 with no expiry date. It was scored based on the old grade four system, based on a new system and classification list, I am a grade five. Do I need a new card? So Rosemary, good questions. I'm gonna answer the second question first. We no longer have classification cards. So you need to be looking at the EC website, master list, and finding your name. You should see your name there 
with your profile, but you should notice that your grade has been changed to represent the current grade systems and you should be a grade five. While you're there, check and make sure all your compensating aids are correct. If your status was confirmed and there's been no change in your health condition, you do not need to see a classifier or be reclassified in Canada. So that brings me to your second question, which you've been classified in, the, as a, in Canada. I cannot speak to whether the British dressage will accept your EC card as a classification. They may require that you be classified in Britain in order to be able to compete in British competition. Actually, if it's an FEI classification, they'll accept it. Correct. But I don't, I don't know if Rosemary's been done internationally or just nationally. It sounded like just a national uh, classification. I, I, as I'm in the UK, I'll check that one out for you, Sue. Um, what, a question from another rider in Canada who says, I'm having my forms filled out by my doctor and by coach for me to get, get certain approvals. Uh, to be classified. Will I be able to go to classification this year and do I send the money in now? So unfortunately, as I stated earlier, COVID-19 has ground to a halt all classifications at this time and there are no uh, scheduled classification opportunities uh, scheduled in the foreseeable future. So at this moment, I would not um, get forms completed or follow through on that, we will notify and through EC when we're able to um, schedule classification um, sessions and it would be most appropriate at that time to get the information completed by your doctor because we do need the most current information. If it's too old, we don't accept it. Thank you. And then there's a couple more questions. Um, is Parkinson's disease um, a classifiable impairment? It's a neurological um, impairment. So um, if we, sorry, the impairment would be um, in the area of coordination. And so that is an eligible impairment we would need a diagnosis, which is Parkinson's. So that is an eligible diagnosis. So that together with evidence that it significantly impacts the individual would mean that they would be eligible to apply for classification. So I'm going with the short version is yes, that is, an eligible scenario. And but again, the, paper, the sorry, paperwork will be reviewed. Um, and another question on those lines, um, could you just confirm that uh, challenges such as ADHD, etc., are not classifiable unless they are accompanied by a physical impairment? At this time in Canada, those riders with intellectual impairments are not eligible for paradressage unless, as you said, there's another eligible impairment with an underlying health condition. So ADHD, attention deficit syndromes, hyperactivity, they're not eligible for paradressage. Thank you. And then um, one more question on, on my list. What do you mean by standard medical tests and can you give examples? So, well, they are very standard medical tests. They're, they're no surprise. So I'm gonna say that any individual that's had a, an impairment or that's significant um, to their function will have seen a medical doctor and specialist as well as a physiotherapist for an assessment and treatment of their, um, I'm gonna say diagnosis or their problem. So the tests that the, the 
physio or the medical doctor performs are the same. And by standard, I mean that the FEI has approved these tests that are applied equally no matter where you are or who you are throughout the world. So you can be classified in Australia or I was going to say Iceland, but we don't have uh, classifiers there. But if you're done in Australia or you're done in Brazil or you're done in British Columbia, you will have the same test applied in the same manner. So it is a standardized test that is accepted for measuring that particular impairment. And as I said, you don't need to study for them. They're nothing special. Most people are panicked until they get in there and realize this is the same old test that they've done with their physio and their doctor several times before. Thank you. And I will ask this question. I think, I think this question is um, possibly too long to deal with tonight. But the question itself is, it is said that FEI tests are at the highest skill level of a para-athlete. Sometimes in the grade two, they compete at walk and trots, and yet for the freestyle, they are allowed to include patterns in canter. To me, this says the grade two riders should be competing at a lower level canter dressage test. What are your thoughts on that, Sue? I, um, so I think we're talking two different things here. So classification does not write the FEI tests and we don't write their freestyles. That is done by a different committee. So the classifiers look at the rider's impairment and their functional ability and the results of that describe their profile and their grade. We are not looking at their riding skill level. The FEI does review the tests that they have and the patterns within those tests, and they do get changed periodically. So that's a different process through um, Equestrian Canada has an opportunity at the International Paraform, which is held once every two years, to put forth their comments regarding the FEI tests. So I would encourage the whoever to look in that direction and send your comments in that way. So and, I, that. and I would just add that if the classifiers give the athlete um, a grade, they have to compete in that grade. And if the fact that sometimes in their freestyle they can do a little bit more because their riding ability um, is developed, then so be it. I agree, Clive. Yeah. The, um, some of the times we see exceptional athletes who have just the perfect setting of um, their support team, their horse, their equipment, and it allows them to have just exceptional performance. Um, not all our athletes are going to be like that. And so some athletes are able to do a little more, not a lot. Um, in their freestyle. And I would also, uh, as you know, I, I totally agree with you, I think I would also say that just because you can do more advanced paces or movements in your freestyle, it is not rewarded. There is no mark for degree of difficulty. However, if you ride, say, the trot badly and you're a grade one rider, then it will, uh, you will be penalized in harmony, submission, rider marks. And you also will probably be penalized in the choreography marks as well. So just because you can ride more advanced movements or paces doesn't necessarily mean it's a good thing. It's always about, um, you know, trying to find that middle ground really isn't it yes and that's it that's it for the questions um thank you very very much indeed oh hang on there's one more question coming in 
so I can deal with that. Um, the whole presentation will be put on YouTube as soon as we can, um, including all the slides and everything else. They will all be on YouTube and on the EC website as soon as we can get them on there. Um, and also one more question, Sue. What happens if the athlete is reclassified before the competition? Would the athlete be allowed to ride at the lower grade they were graded at previously? So as a result of classification um, just prior to the competition, um, the athlete, there are rules about that. So the athlete can choose to either ride the test that they've prepared for, or they can ride the lower test in the case of someone whose grade was lowered. However, uh, they can also choose to ride up the grade. So some of the times the rider improved and so they were um, reclassified and their grade went up. So there are rules about how things will be um, scored in that case should they choose to remain at the lower grade in the example of the improved rider but the other rider can go down. In Canada, this doesn't occur um, to date because our events um, are separate from our classification uh, sessions. So usually the athletes classified and they're ready to go well in advance of the competition. Whereas internationally, we are classifying them the day before they compete and there can occasionally be changes in their profiling grade. And so in the international forum, these athletes are sometimes uh, having to choose whether they stay at what they prepared for or move to their newly assigned grade with, with sometimes penalty. So you need to know your rules is the bottom line here. Uh, one more question before we really should probably wrap this up. If you have a profile, in a if you are classified, are you able to compete in able-bodied competitions? In Canada, yes, you are. So our uh, para-dressage riders can cross-enter into able-bodied dressage classes. They are able to use their compensating aids that are assigned. And this is why it's so important that you make sure you submit your compensating aid master list with your entry and that you identify yourself as a para-athlete so that the steward and the judge know why you have special equipment or adaptive aids. Um, if you do not give your compensating aids list in when you submit your uh, entry um, and no one knows, um, at the time of tack check, you may be eliminated because obviously the para dressage equipment is not standard for able bodied. So we just need that piece of paper to uh, confirm why you're using the special equipment. Excellent. And I think on that note, Sue, do we want to go to the final slide? Which sure. just, ex just explains about the updating hours for certification. I think that's probably pretty, for those of you that have been asking for questions about the maintenance of certification, then that's how you do it. And if we haven't answered any of your questions tonight, please feel free to email a question in Canada and we'll get them answered privately as soon as we can. So on, so on that note, Sue, I'd like to thank you again for a very informative. Well, thank you very much for... And uh, opens up. Thank yeah. you very much, Clive, for. I think Sue's frozen again. So um, thank you, Sue, and to thanks all for the attendees who have participated tonight. And I hope you found it very, very useful. Thank you very much, and good night. <laughs>